Okay, I think we're in a good position to uh, get started. My name is Barton Beebe. I teach at uh, NYU uh, Law, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for today's event. I've been looking forward to it for some time, uh, primarily like for my own edification as to uh, how NFTs function in the art world and in you know, global capitalism more generally. And we have an absolutely fantastic uh, panel assembled today to help us with these questions or the actual proper title of the forum, NFTs explained to the extent possible. And I actually think in, in chatting with Mitchell, Chris, and Amy uh, in preparation for this, I think we'll get pretty far in explaining them to you and demystifying them to you. So I will introduce uh, our three panelists briefly. And then uh, the plan is that we'll, I'll, I'll pose a few questions and topics to the panelists for a while. Um, and hopefully the, my questions or our questions and topics will anticipate many of your questions and topics, those who are uh, joining this forum, and then we'll open things up for uh, Q&A. Uh, so first, let me introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, Mitchell Chan is a Toronto-based uh, artist. Uh, already widely acclaimed for his public and gallery works, in 2017, Mitchell launched one of the first NFT art projects on the Ethereum blockchain. His work, Digital Zones of Immaterial Pictorial Sensibility, was recently auctioned by Sotheby's. And it's pretty spectacular. And you can check it out online. Maybe we'll post some uh, links about this story um, in the chat. He is one of the leading voices in the NFT art world. Um, if, if you're not really in the NFT art world, I can, and, and I'm not, but I've read a lot about it and talked to people, he is a very big deal uh, in the NFT art world, even though he's an incredibly friendly guy and all of that stuff. Uh, uh, he's, we're just so fortunate that he has taken the time uh, from his current location uh, to join us in this discussion of uh, NFT uh, art. Um, Amy Adler is the Emily Kempkin Professor of Law here at NYU Law. I should say, I didn't clear any of these introductions with the panelists because I only wanted to embarrass them once, okay? Uh, in my view, Amy is the most interesting and important law scholar in the country. Uh, I think that view is shared by many. Her articles, Against Moral Rights, Why Art Does Not Need Copyright, and most recently, Fair Use and the Future of Art are at the top of any reading list uh, in the area of art law. Her current project, The Artifice of Authenticity, situates the rise of NFTs within, within the art world's century-long conversation about authenticity and uh, copy. Chris Brigman is the Murray and Kathleen uh, Bring Professor of Law here at NYU Law. He is a leading commentator on copyright law and much else in intellectual property and antitrust law. In 2015, the American Law Institute appointed him as the reporter for the ALI's restatement of copyright project. If you're wondering what that means, that means he's basically like in charge of the project and responsible for its success. If you're wondering further what that means, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the Christian imagery of Saint Sebastian, the guy with all the arrows in him, who nevertheless manages to, to rise into sainthood. That's Chris. Um, more to the point for today, uh, this is really exciting because in my own class, we read his brief. Along with professors Rebecca Tushnet and Mark McKenna, Chris is representing Mason Rothschild, the artist, in the ongoing headline-making Meta Birkin's NFT litigation, which we'll have uh, some time to talk about uh, as we proceed. So um, with those introductions uh, on the record, let's get right to it. And uh, I guess I could joke like, gosh, I'm the moderator for this panel on NFTs. What would my first question be? I just have no idea how we could possibly start. And then, you know, obviously the question is, which I'll present to, to Mitchell, what is an NFT? What are NFTs? What are we even talking about today? Sure. And that's a great place to start. And I'll answer just bare bones technically. An NFT is basically a number with some data attached to it. So how this looks is that NFTs are issued from a smart contract that lives on the Ethereum blockchain. That is um, a little bit of code that is uploaded to, in most cases, Ethereum, a blockchain, which makes it so that that code is can reliably not going to go anywhere. Um, and that code, that little computer program has the ability to do a couple of really simple things. First of all, it can count. It can count in integers. It can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then it is basically a ledger that says uh, number one has linked to it an address of a wallet that owns number one. Um, it also says that number one is linked to some metadata. This metadata is configurable. It can exist on different standards, but normally that metadata has um, information about an image to which the owner is entitled. 
or you know owns according to according to the blockchain if not according to the law i don't know we'll figure out if that means according to the law or not um and the reason why digital images have become uh you know sort of the common like art form that is exchanged on blockchain is because as you can imagine it's sort of difficult to assert that that number and that address is in fact you know the rightful owner of some physical object that exists outside the digital art world but with digital images what you can do is you can almost like you can zip a file well you can kind of create a secret code for any digital image any digital file really called a hash and that hash will only unlock the image that looks exactly like the image you uh, are asserting this token to be linked to. And that's what an NFT is, a number, a wallet address, and some metadata that typically includes a compressed secret key um, that corresponds to an image. So Mitchell, that raises like a number of really interesting questions that I'm sure uh, we all have, and, and I'll just jump in with a few of them. Um, one is like, what attracted you as an artist to the NFT medium like what did you see in nfts that you thought okay uh two 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 dimensional painting sculpture you know all that let's do nfts let's work with nfts what was there that got you thinking about what to do well there, there's there's a rich history of artists who use legal apparatuses or the law as kind of a medium, right? They try to they try to pull on some of those threads that they see are loose there in you know legal structures. Um, and and Amy has has written about some of them like superbly. Yeah. And there's a rich history of artists who have done the same thing with economic systems. They find some kind of quirk in the system and they try to exploit it to make us think about it. Um, and I'm you know sort of an, an, an artist in that tradition. Um, and so inevitably I came to realizing that blockchain was something that was, first of all, difficult to get our heads around, not just technically, but conceptually, philosophically. And it's important that we have sort of artsy conversations about blockchain because it seemed apparent that it was going to become a very powerful force in our lives. So setting about to make art um, on blockchain, thinking about how to apply an artist's perspective to this, I start thinking about you know, ownership and how artworks have been transferred. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I've, you know, done some coding work, uh, um, I've worked in computer programming. So as I'm getting into the details of how we would transact art on the blockchain, I very quickly realized that I can't actually use the blockchain as my canvas, all right? I can't actually draw a picture on the blockchain or upload a picture to the blockchain. Um, and that is because data storage on blockchain is prohibitively expensive. The only thing that I could do on blockchain, I realized, was essentially make a set of receipts for artworks, right? And those receipts would have to be, you know, uh, um, their correspondence to an artwork would have to be enforced, I suppose, actually through, you know, trust or faith in the artist and, and, and his or her goodwill. Um, but this seems quite interesting to me that I would move the focus of my art project away from the physical material presence of the artwork and onto the vehicle that we're using for transacting it. And I start to think, well, has anybody like done this? Is, is there a is, is, is there an analog precedent for this? Um, and one of the artists who worked very intelligently in thinking about how his artwork was transacted was the French artist Yves Klein. And I discovered a project that he had created in 1958, which did exactly this, um, which separated you know, the rituals for how we experience an artwork from the rituals through which we transact the artwork. And I said, well, this is a model that I believe, you know, can be applied to blockchain. So I coded it up and it was really just through translating a 60 year old set of rules for the transfer of artwork that I sort of accidentally created um, one of the first NFTs and sort of began the conversation uh, about, you know, that Eve Klein project really being the spiritual predecessor to the NFT, which is like ironically actually sort of culminated today is one of those receipts that I based my project on like the physical paper ones. Actually, I just 
finished, I was involved in an auction at Sotheby's and one of them just, <laughs> just sold at Sotheby's for $1.2 million before <laughs> I got on this call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and that's, that's, a receipt. that's not the artwork, that's the receipt, the receipt. For artwork that yeah. existed. Yeah. So th there too, many questions can follow from it, but um, uh, Mitchell, I want to invite you to show the image of the work and then the code, um, but where this is really leading is Amy, I wanted to ask you about how Mitchell's work is interacting with these norms of authenticity that have been problematic from like, I don't know, the beginning of the 20th century or the beginning since, I don't know, Plato or something. But first let's take a look at Mitchell's uh, work and get a sense of what he did. Yeah, I, look, it was very simple. It was about the fact that whenever we have a robust system for the transaction of receipts, um, the way that this is revolutionary conceptually is that the artwork itself no longer carries the burden of needing to be transactable, right? Like it, it now all of a sudden, because you can have a robust receipt for anything, therefore anything becomes a sort of viable like medium for making art. The way that Klein exploited this, he was just delighted by this, was that he could make what he claimed were invisible artworks. He claimed these, these were pure sensibilities that he was imbuing onto the viewer. And so I would attempt to do, to do a, a, a similar thing. And I would create these receipts were for ultimately empty digital spaces, right? Which, you know, I also felt was a little bit of a metaphor for what was happening in the blockchain space um, as well, right? There was, there was a, lot of, a lot of snake oil getting sold on blockchain around 2017. And uh, you would have to really trust the, the, the good faith of the, um, uh, you know, of the seller as to whether or not that was, that was absolutely anything. And, you know, this is like, you were asking, you know, what is an NFT? It's pretty, not sexy. It's a little bit of code um, that looks like this. And it's not, it's not particularly long, but these are the mm -hmm. functions that they count the numbers and they attach wallets to the numbers and they attach metadata to the numbers. And just to be clear, this is then the code that is um, saved into the blockchain. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, for anyone else to read, is that right? Like anyone can access this code. Anybody can go ahead and find this contract address 0x4b29, whatever, whatever, uh -huh. whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then blockchain itself, here, I'll take a stab at it and then you can correct me. It's I see it as just a, a long ledger of which there are many, many copies around the world. Uh, created in such a way that it's it's almost impossible to change the ledger entries once they've been um, put into the to the list. Is, That's is, exactly it. it okay. Exactly it. There are um, a couple of permutations on that, like the description that you've given as basically a permanent ledger that is distributed across multiple computers. Um, would, would I think is a, a very accurate description of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin okay. blockchain. And then the revolution of Ethereum, it's sort of like Bitcoin is like a spreadsheet that just records numbers. And then Ethereum is a spreadsheet, but like where you can, you can put those spreadsheet functions in, okay. you know, like, so you yeah. can write little programs, right, on your, on your spreadsheet. And they'll always execute and they'll always execute the right way. And um, yeah. So um, this is, feels suddenly a long way from art. Um, but Amy, I, I, knowing your work, um, it's not, it turns out. Um, and the kind of uh, work that Mitchell has done and has been so successful with is part of a much grander tradition, interrogating norms of authenticity that also end up bringing in all sorts of legal questions. So I wanted at the very beginning of our discussion to sort of get that on the record, like what is this tradition and how does NFT participate in it? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, NFTs can be used to, to um, point to anything. These, these entries in the um, blockchain can point to anything, but um, they first burst into national consciousness really with the sale and, and Mitchell, of course, and his um, brilliance was preceding this in his work, um, but with the sale a little over a year ago of a work by the digital artist Beeple. Um, I kind of hate to mention his work in the same breath as yours, Mitchell, but, um, but it, you know, just because I, it's hard to evaluate it as art in a way that it, it is with your work, but um, 
That work sold for $69 million. And basically it was this token, this code is um, similar to what Mitchell was showing us, pointing to a digital work of art that anyone can download, anyone can write, click and save. And although again, NFTs can be connected to anything, um, the typical use that we've seen so far is this, a token pointing to a digital image or clip um, that's freely available. So I think the question that people have struggled with this kind of common sense question, um, people new to NFTs struggle with is, why would you wanna buy something for $69 million, no less, the most expensive NFT sold so far for vast sums of money that it seems like anyone else can have? Because when you buy an NFT, again, it's the typical scenario, it's not necessarily always the case, but the typical scenario is you don't have copyright in the underlying image. Everyone can access it, everyone can see it. Um, everyone can right click and save it. So all you have is this thing pointing to the image. Why is that so expensive if everyone else can, can have the image itself? And um, I'm here and I think building on, on what Mitchell was saying about the Eve Klein works, um, I'm here to tell you that this structure of ownership and value is not revolutionary and not new. It's certainly new in terms of using um, the blockchain. Um, instead, it has a long precedent in the art world where artists and art market professionals have long considered what it means to create an authentic work of art in a world of replication and copying. And there are many, many precedents for this story. It's long and it's complex, but I'm gonna take one that I think will help um, illuminate this and take us out of out of um, crypto language for a second and into art language, but I hope it's a little bit um, makes it easier to understand. So I'm going to give us an example, and for students of mine who are in the in this room know this example well. I'm going to give the example of, um, of a minimalist artist called Dan Flavin, a very revered minimalist artist working in the '60s, who made work out of fluorescent light bulbs. Now, some of these works were quite simple, nothing more than a fluorescent tube leaning against a wall. And you can see, and they were made with everyday hardware light bulbs. So you can see how any of us could go um, buy a, a light bulb at a hardware store. It's a little difficult now to find the same technology as was used in 1960. But theoretically, we could just go to the hardware store, buy a fluorescent tube, lean it against the wall, and we would have, it seems, a Flavin sculpture. But we wouldn't, in fact, and a Flavin sculpture, let's just say ballpark a million, maybe a little bit more. We wouldn't, in fact, have a Flavin sculpture because we don't have what makes a Flavin real and different from all the other light bulbs one has in the world. And that is a certificate of authenticity. Now, this was, we could really think of it as a non-fungible token, but written on a piece of paper rather than in the blockchain. And this is this long precedent. And just to help us understand the relationship between the image or in this case, the, the object, the work of art, and this um, certificate of authenticity. So let's imagine that you're, you're in a car and you're going on a joyride and you're driving down the highway and your windows are open and you're blasting your music and um, suddenly your Dan Flavin sculpture flies out the window and you reach out and you grab the certificate of authenticity and you catch it before it flies out the window. You have still got your, let's say, million dollar sculpture, even though the bulbs are gone. You've got that certificate that allows you to, you know, go get more light bulbs. The value is there. If it happened the other way around, if you're if you're driving down the highway and your certificate flies out the window, but you grab onto your sculpture, in fact, you no longer have a Dan Flavin sculpture. Now all you've got are some light bulbs. And I think this relationship between the object, um, the fungible object really, and the non-fungible certificate is really a perfect um, um, analog for and precedent for the model of ownership that um, we see now in the art world. And I, I don't, again, I don't think it's an accident that NFTs first captured public attention or that the most expensive NFT sold to date was in the art context, because I think art and its market were already ready. Now, there are many other precedents, and we can talk about this, where, where people in the art world, artists, art market participants, have been thinking about problems of authenticity in a world of copying. We could look at Andy Warhol as having really contemplated some of these questions. You know, what's it, what's it mean? What's the difference between his Brillo box and the cardboard Brillo boxes that you know everyone could have? 
Um, we could look at the market for photography, where there really is a kind of artificial scarcity in a, in a realm where um, things are, a photograph is theoretically endlessly reproducible. But um, I want to just say one, one final thing that unites um, the non-fungible token world and the art world, and that is the role played by authenticity in creating value. So I think we as lawyers typically come into this and say, think to ourselves, how do you create value for, let's just go back to an image. Um, you do so by excluding others from copying it. That's copyright law. It's a whole premise of copyright law. That's not the model by which artworks, the art market works or the NFT market works. We, NFT owners, um, copyright owners of the underlying image don't care about stopping other people from copying. They care about um, th this certificate, this certificate guaranteeing authenticity is where the value is. And um, I've, I've written about this and I won't go into it now, but um, my view is that the art market works on exactly the same principle where copyright is not the mechanism that creates value. Instead, there's this norm of authenticity, complicated um, and unstable, but still there, that does all the work in creating value, rendering our legal assumptions about the relationship between law and copying and value totally wrong. <laughs> so um, we can talk more about that, but... Um, stop there. So uh, this might make a nice transition to the question I want to ask of, of Chris, which is sort of along the lines of what Amy, you were talking about, is what exactly are people buying when they buy an NFT? Um, what do they think they're buying? And uh, how does this relate to intellectual property law? I mean, Amy, I was really struck by a passage in your current draft uh, for the uh, uh, project on authenticity, where you a judge explains, I know the art world won't care what I say, um, but this is what the law is gonna say. And that's how I'm gonna rule in this particular case. I, you, you would know the detail, I can't remember the particular case in which that happened. But that makes me as a lawyer feel a little bit like, hey, wait a minute, what, you know, what about us? Um, but Chris, you know, um, what is the role of law in this, uh, if any? Well, okay, so I'll get to that in a minute, but your, your yeah. initial question, what are they buying? Yeah. Are people buying? So, so it's interesting. So um, the art world, I think, has been ready for this, as Amy says. So people think when they're buying a Dan Flavin, what are they buying? They're buying an artifact, but they're also buying the certificate. And as Amy says, the value lies in the certificate. The artifact can be rebuilt, replaced. Um, you know, that's not the way most art has worked for most of human history, right? So pe people have been focused on the canonical object, the authentic object. It's the artifact that they focused on. And often certificates of authenticity have helped kind of regulate that, helped, you know, form those markets. But, you know, we've been grown used to the art world aside, we, we typically have grown, regular people have grown used to thinking of art as kind of authentic artifacts. Uh, the authentic Giacometti sculpture, the authentic painting from, you know, Chagall. So uh, one of the ways in which NFTs were sold early, and I, I think this was a mirage, but the, an early way of talking about them was that NFTs were a way of establishing which copy of the digital artwork was the authentic copy. So in other words, someone has a digital image that they're auctioning, um, it's easy to make copies of this because it's a digital image. You can right click and save. There might be a thousand copies, a million copies floating around on the internet, but the, the, the NFT early was sold as a way of identifying the canonical copy. And for reasons that Mitchell hinted at, that's actually not true. So if, if an image um, is hashed, so if, if the contents of a data file are run through a cryptographic algorithm and you get a hash, and that hash is encoded as metadata into an NFT, what the NFT is good at is telling you if you have a copy of the image. It's not good at telling you if you have the copy of the image. So the, the initial way that some people were selling NFTs just turns out to be kind of a MacGuffin. It's not, it's not right. So another, another thing that people are buying, and I think this gets more to what Amy is saying, is the idea of a kind of relocation of value. So, you know, the elite parts of the art world have done this for a while. This is the Dan Flavin story. But I think now what, what's, go, what's going on is that kind of elite way of viewing things has to some extent been democratized. And I mean by that, um, 
maybe people don't care so much that digital images are freely reproducible if they can perform the mental gymnastics of re relocating the value, right? The what we're transacting over from the artifact and the, the question of what's the authentic copy of the artifact to the ownership claim, which is authenticated by the non-fungible token. So to take Amy's Flavin example, so you know, Amy says, well, if you if your Flavin sculpture flies out the window, but you have their certificate of authenticity, maybe you can rebuild the sculpture and you still have the value, which I think is right. Similarly, if you know you have the Beeple image, if you're the auction buyer for the Beeple image and you have the NFT linked to the Beeple any particular copy of that image every day is that digital collage that you present to the market along with the NFT is going to be the copy that suffices, right, for any further transaction in the good. You know, and I think that responds to me anyway, that responds to a real human need. That responds to a world in which one of the anchors that we used to use to kind of judge authenticity, the kind of provenance of the artifact that's like just really difficult to keep track of in the digital environment. And so what are we doing? We're taking the insights of the art world that Amy describes and we're kind of generalizing them, maybe. Now, you know, I, I say maybe because um, I think for a lot of people, this is gonna be actually a difficult move to make. This, this detaching themselves from the artifact and thinking of all art in this more conceptual way that the art world has kind of become accustomed to. Um, maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. But I, I think that that is a truer understanding of what people are buying. And it's also actually potentially a very socially valuable thing as well, because it, it helps us to think, I think more critically, but also you know, more productively about how art in the digital environment is going to work and art markets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Mitchell, coming back to you, I, I wonder if I could ask you to speculate on what you think buyers' motives are. It's um, one thing I greatly admire this, this project that you've uh, undertaken and the, how early you were on the scene, uh, how well you've executed this whole, this whole project, this whole thing. Um, but someone spent uh, quite a lot of money to in a way join the project in a particularly special way. What's motivating that buyer do you think so i'll speak in general terms and um i think what is at the core of this is visibility and attention right which should come like as 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 no surprise and you know one of the things that christopher and amy just spoke about was how you know typically the art world has functioned on like a model of exclusivity right like sort of be be elite but you know what we're seeing more and more is that visibility is what has the most value. I like to use you know the example of like you know why why are the pyramids so big? It really doesn't take up that much space to store your desiccated corpse, um, but you want everybody to be able to see it, all right? And everybody being able to see it actually has a function for you, which is that it demonstrates your considerable power. Um, and so visibility is important. Of course, now visibility happens in the digital space. And so the reproducibility of the images linked to these NFTs is a feature of the technology. And actually they are becoming increasingly valuable because anybody can download and save a copy. The more people download and save a copy, all of those copies are pointing to you, right? Um, and so basically, yeah, it's a way of like formally directing your attention and in like the in the space the nft space right we would call this flex culture um and then of course so we have we have a couple of things going on here one is that we have every nft can be like a sort of beacon a nexus a node in the attention economy that can draw all the attention of the image to itself and then then we have the idea that those nodes those little attention nodes are ex they were created on top of a financial technology that was intended to make any asset programmed on them as liquid and easily transactable as possible. So 
there are two kind of like steps in markets when things become really valuable. Things become really valuable when we learn how to count things, okay? And now all of a sudden, basically what, what blockchain has given us is a way to really accurately count things, including these digital assets. And then things get really valuable again whenever there are extremely fast liquid markets set up, right? Because things can skyrocket to the moon very, very quickly. So both of these things happen very, very quickly. So, you know, get on board and, you know, get this sort of like, you know, note of attention and power. And then plus it's already plugged into this amazingly like supercharged marketplace and you have what could be, uh, you know, an incredible speculative asset. All right. Yeah. And because I know Amy's and Chris's work uh, reasonably well, I'm hearing their work and like everything you've just said. And before going to Chris, Amy, I, I happen to know, you know, I'll embarrass you a little by quoting you. Um, as with so much of the contemporary art world, copies confer rather than usurp value. And I, you know, I'll just speak for myself, the sort of, um, and we, we know the Walter Benjamin old story of, the, and Chris, you with Cal Rastiala, and more recently with uh, Stefan Bechtolz of ETH, who another plug for NYU Law School, is currently visiting uh, at NYU Law School, I'm happy to say. Chris, you've written about this as, as well, but Amy, I think this, this, this point is so important. I just wanted to ask you to speak a little more to that. Yeah, thank, thank you. You know, as I was listening to you talk, Mitchell, I was just thinking about how um, that makes so much sense in the, in the digital um, world, in the digital world that copies, copies, you know, drawing attention to the work is something valuable. It makes sense in Instagram culture. It makes sense in meme culture. It makes sense, I think, in the art world. But believe it or not, uh, the legal world can't fathom this model. The legal world, which is based on copyright, the, the whole premise of copyright is we've got to ward off unauthorized copies because they're going to supplant the value of the original. In, in the marketplace. And the last thing somebody wants to do if you own an original work is let people copy it, at least in an unauthorized way. That's the whole premise of copyright law. It makes no sense in this new model. And you know, this is something that I have been tracing for a while in, in the art world where copying confers value and in other places too. And you know, it's a really interesting challenge for us as lawyers to try to come to grips with a market and a world in which value um, works exactly the opposite of how law assumes. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, in your also recent working paper, you talk about aura. And I just wanted to get that on the, the record as well and take advantage of that to insert a term that surprisingly hasn't come up yet, but I know it's Amy and Mitchell, you, you both talked to, and that is the idea of art by fiat or fiat art. And I'll convert it into like, I happened th through a colleague up at uh, Columbia Art History uh, colleague, there's this tradition of, of um, uh, medallions you could collect as you made your pilgrimage around the various holy sites of Europe. The val certain medallions were especially valuable in the middle ages because they are actually touched to the bone of Christ or touched to, there was something about the touch of the artist or of the God or whatever else. And Chris, with uh, Stefan's work, especially most recently, you've talked about how to invest mass produced things or whatever with this aura. Uh, say a little more about that, if, if I'm yeah, so you, you can you can think of NFTs as part of a larger thing that's happening in society, which is the the attempt to invest objects with aura that, you know, Walter Benjamin, you know, writing a generation ago or two generations ago wouldn't have thought could be invested with aura. So Walter Benjamin, um, writing just before World War II, basically thinks of um, the big change in the world happening in his time is the, the explosion of photography, right? And he's thinking, okay, so photography is going to really change the world. It's, it's going to allow us to reproduce virtually costlessly um, sacred objects, right? So art, and by reproducing this art and letting people have access to it, this will kind of drain the, the, the preciousness out of the authentic artifact, right? This will basically open up 
um, access to art, but there's also something, there's a loss. Um, there's, there's this kind of death of aura, the aura of, you know, uh, a very old work that pa that passes down through time that we, you know, we all crowd into the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. That's the kind of canonical example of a work with tremendous aura. It, it's, it's always, I think, the fact that when you get there, you're disappointed because it, it looks small and it's surrounded by people and bulletproof glass, right? But that aside. Um, so he thinks like mechanical reproduction is going to cause the death of aura. It's going to change art. Um, it's going to take away a lot of its aesthetic power, but it's going to open up access. And he's a Marxist. So on the whole, he thinks that's a pretty good trade-off. He's satisfied with it. So the, the paper with Stefan, we think about this again, because, you know, in the, the digital world we live in, mechanical reproduction had nothing on electronic reproduction, right? So digital reproduction is photography run amok. It's like virtually costless to make endless copies of every digital artifact. Um, this is true in the world as well, you know, to, to a lesser extent, but it's also true of, you know, chairs and tables. It's true of salamis. It's, it's true of all kinds of artifacts that once were precious and difficult to get a hold of. You know, you didn't get a Bergamo salami unless you lived in the area of Italy around Bergamo. And now you can get a Bergamo salami in the Whole Foods. And that has to do not with digital, you know, um, the digital world, but with the growth of logistics and the growth of, you know, easy, cheap transport. These products, as they become ubiquitous, you might think, well, the aura would be drawn out of them. They'd become commodities. And, you know, there's a process that we describe in the paper of reinstilling aura. So in the, in the art world, you know, NFTs are providing an erratic experience. So people don't look for the value in the authentic copy of the Beeple collage. They, they look for value in the authentic ownership claim. In, in the case of, you know, salamis, people look for a narrative. They don't, they don't just consume the salami, they consume the history of the salami, they consume the culture from which the salami came. And there's a whole marketing apparatus dedicated to that. In the case of furniture, people just don't sit in a chair. They consume the narrative of the Eames chair. And you know, the, 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 the company in Europe, for example, that has a monopoly on the Eames chair, the Vitra company, um, they spend a lot of time enforcing intellectual property rights to remain in control of that narrative for as long as they can. Um, to make that chair, not just um, a chair, but an aesthetic experience, right? To re-inject aura, well, or to inject aura into something that Benjamin never thought would carry it. Um, mm -hmm. So this is, um, you know, the, the NFTs, I think, are part of this. They're situated. It's, it's kind of dis a distillation of this phenomenon in the art world. But this phenomenon is broader than that, I think. Okay. And so I'll take that as my excuse for talking about trademark law. Uh, I'm a primarily a trademark specialist. That's the hammer I have. So everything is, is a nail for that hammer. Um, but um, in terms of trademark law, I suppose the question I have is, d does this NFT phenomenon, uh, is it scalable to, uh, the, for lack of a better term, the masses? Um, it's one thing for a million dollars to be spent by a tech person on something like this. But is it, and I don't have a prior on this, is it imaginable that NFTs could be used in the way that standard old trademarks like the, uh, well, this is a unique example, but Supreme or the standard example LV or Gucci or Nike or Ford on a pickup truck. Can NFTs expand out beyond the elite art worlds into consumer society. Any, and here I'll open it up to anyone on this possibility. So Mitchell, you're, it looks like you're muted, but yeah. I'll tackle that first and then I'll Great. leave it to the people who yeah. can talk more about the logistics of that. But yeah. like what you've just described is the fever dream of a significant portion of NFT collectors um, where this phenomenon of NFTs, it's sort of now move, we're at this point in the market where it's moved past art and into, I'm sure, you know, you've all seen Paris Hilton's lovely ape. Okay. Um, but, you know, the board eight yacht, the Board Ape Yacht Club collection is probably like the exemplar of this phenomenon where people want to see these NFT collections as brands. And Supreme is an amazing example, right? Because Supreme is basically an empty vessel for collaborations. And with, with every collaborator that comes and goes, they sort of leave this little accretion of legitimacy and value and whatever, right? And so what a lot of these NFT collections are leveraging is that the idea that everybody who 
owns a piece in this collection can be kind of like, I mean, I mean, is in very like real terms, a stakeholder in the value of that overall brand. And what's interesting is there's this kind of movement of foot in like the NFT community among certain collectors where they actually want the commercial rights for their individual ape. No, never mind that most of these apes look more or less the same. They just have maybe different hats, right? Or, diff or like different glasses or whatever. But the idea to go and, you know, license that, turn into a brand like Supreme, where they could have not just like ape hoodies, but hoodies of your, of, of ape 3247, right? Um, or whatever. And they really are looking at this brand model as the future of how they're going to monetize their assets out there in the world of like physical goods and IPs and movies and entertainment franchises. Is that realistic? I don't know. Um, and is that goal of essentially being able to monetize the aura or legitimacy or prestige of your particular NFT at odds with that community's ins insistence that the stewardship of the overall brand be distributed among all collectors. Because as Christopher said, the Eames chair, right, is like licensed by a foundation that works very hard to make sure that brand keeps adjacent. So sorry, that was like a whole can of worms, but it's yeah. like all, the, all of the conversation around the question you just asked is really fascinating right now. I'll, I'll just add something quickly. And then I think it'd be great to hear from, from Chris, who's actually, litigating a trademark NFT case that's super interesting. Um, but I will just say, I think building on what Mitchell said, there's a, there's a way in which NFTs are really being used right now to self-brand. Um, and you know, particularly, I think, with the Board Ape Yacht Club images and the CryptoPunks, using them as your, even if you don't acquire the commercial rights to them, which of course is an important part of the story, just the way that that becomes your um, your Twitter avatar or your or your Discord avatar signals so much, you know, that you are connected to this larger brand. And I wouldn't use the word aura the way we've been talking about it. I I, I would think maybe a better word might be authenticity or or even actually brand in this case, but connecting you to this um, to this signifier of cool. But um, but Chris has a cool speaking of cool, a really cool um, case. Let me see if I can share my screen. And uh, I think I'm my- Oh, there, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so um, I represent Mason Rothschild. I'm not gonna talk too deeply about the case. I'll just talk about stuff that's publicly available, but he uh, made a hundred of these digital portraits of Birkin bags. Uh, they're artworks. And um, he sells these artworks and each artwork is associated with an NFT that provides the receipt for the artwork just in the way that, that, that Mitchell described. Um, Hermes uh, sued him, basically saying that they're violating his trademark rights and titling these bags Meta Birkins. Um, Mason's filed a motion to dismiss. So this is in the Southern District of New York and in New York District Court here in, in the city in Manhattan. Um, and the real question is, you know, I think in this case is, um, what's the metaverse going to be about, right? What what is what are NFTs going to be about? I mean, I, I I remember, you know, back in the early days of the web when I was a kid, um, there was this kind of um, almost anarchic quality to it. There were these dreams about, you know, the web would be a great equalizer. It turns out it's really not. You know, it's web's a lot of things. It's it's equalizer sometimes, but it's it's also an incredibly powerful platform for, you know, corporations and the powerful. And, and the question is whether the metaverse is going to be that too. Is the metaverse going to be a place where people are creative and they can um, they can contribute or, or is the metaverse going to be, as, as one recent article put it, an annex in waiting for established brands? And that's, I think, what this what this litigation is about. So, you know, in, obviously these are artworks and artists should be free under the First Amendment to depict what they see in the world around them. So, you know, famously Andy Warhol um, did a series of 32 paintings of Campbell's soup cans. Um, that was a different age when he did those paintings. He got a very nice letter from the director of marketing at the Campbell's soup company who said he really liked them and wished um, he could afford one. Uh, Hermes was not so gracious. Um, they filed this complaint. Our motion to dismiss basically says, look, you know, 
um, the Second Circuit, the, the, the circuit that we're in, balances trademark rights with First Amendment rights in the following way. If the title Meta Birkins, which is the title of the collection, the title of the individual works, if that title is artistically relevant, um, and if the use is not explicitly misleading, then there can't be any trademark infringement. And our argument is, of course, it's artistically relevant. These are he's drawing Birkin bags, and he's you know drawing them essentially as they exist in the metaverse. He's dematerializing them and putting them in the metaverse. So Meta Birkins is clearly an artistically relevant title to the content. In terms of explicit misleadingness, the courts basically have said it can't just be the use of the mark, right? The use of the mark, if if that were all that was required, you know, the First Amendment wouldn't protect anything. You just have the regular confusion claim. There has to be some explicit claim of relationship. So, for example, the Second Circuit tells us that if I released a book uh, called, you know, Jane Fonda's Diet Book, but it, it wasn't actually associated with Jane Fonda, so that would be an explicit claim of connection. Um, not merely an implicit one. We don't think anything like that's going on here. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, this is starting to happen now. So you see these clashes between artists and brands. So StockX, for example, um, is another case that involves a clash that's kind of like this, this time in, not involving Hermes, involving uh, Nike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this raises a question that... Um, I know Hermes has sort of hinted at in its, uh, its uh, pleading or its brief now. Um, and I realize, Chris, you have to be careful how you would address this. So I'll also just ask Amy and, and Mitchell. Um, and I'll try to put it in as cynical terms as possible. And that is that nowadays, anyone can call themselves an artist and as a result, get away with, with bloody murder um, because it's art. And specifically under trademark law, um, so would go the argument. Uh, I call myself an artist, therefore the Rogers v. Grimaldi uh, doctrine applies to me, which means that the plaintiff has to make a much harder showing, almost impossible up until recently with a, a little Ninth Circuit case, much harder showing that I explicitly misled, basically that I intentionally misled people. So now back to this, the general question. There does seem to be in this, because the metaverse or whatever it's going to be called is human made, is a form of human art. A lot of uh, conduct on there can hide behind or claim the mantle of artistry. And um, is that good? Is that bad? What do we do with that? And here too, uh, it's more for anyone on the, on the panel. Um, you know, it really strikes me. I'm sorry, Amy, go ahead. Please. No, I was just going to say, you know, this is not a, um, this is an, a question that the Supreme Court actually wrestled with in an earlier era, in the era of um, when obscenity law was an active thing. And, and there was this, much like with trademark law, there was this carve out in obscenity law. And if your work was, you know, filthy and dirty and disgusting and prurient and all these things, but had this magical quality called art, it was a get out of jail free card, right? So, so then the question became, okay, okay, that's true. We have a carve out for art, much like what you're describing and what Chris is working on in, in this case. But what is it? What is art? Which of course is an impossible age old question. Um, and we see um, the courts struggling over a period of really 16 years, trying to answer that question in various ways, trying to, to get at what that is. And they settled on this phrase that is, has all kinds of unfortunate, um, but I guess understandable um, uh, ramifications that it should only, the exception should only be for works with serious artistic value, which of course is a preposterous um, and impossible standard to apply. But it actually does get courts and, and um, this litigation right into um, a problem that um, certainly has precedent, legal precedent, um, often of judges throwing up their hands, and um, is a longstanding, um, deeply difficult question in the history of philosophy of art. Yeah, I mean, I think of what Justice Holmes said in the Bleistein case, that we shouldn't put judges in charge of making aesthetic discriminations. I mean, that that's, of course, a hopeless thing to want. Judges are going to make aesthetic discriminations. The question is, how often and how deep? Um, you know, look, in, in the case of um, digital art, um, th there's an image, right, that people are buying. Um, there's an NFT associated with the image. There's a market for this. Um, to some degree, you know, look, if the images are 
images that people like are attracted to, um, there'll be a market in them. Um, if the images are not images that people value, there's nothing attractive about them, there's nothing compelling, people won't value them. Um, now that, 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 that value could be purely aesthetic. Um, maybe in the case of the Meta Birkins, it's at least partially aesthetic. That value could be conceptual. So some people could be attracted to the idea of, you know, what does it mean to take a luxury item into the metaverse? Um, but nonetheless, whether it's aesthetic or conceptual or a mixture of both, um, I think the market probably is, you know, speaking here um, and judges should probably listen. Mitchell, could I ask you, like, is it, um, does it dilute the brand of the artist <laughs> that you've got the, some, um, uh, I mean, I actually think in Hermes case, uh, I think Meta Burke, I, Rogers v. Grimaldi has been created to, for um, Rothschild. I mean, I think there, there's not that hard of a case, it turns out. Um, but are there other situations where you're seeing people say this is art and you're sort of like, mm, you haven't really done the time sort of thing? Oh, absolutely. And okay. in fact, I would I would actually disagree with what Christopher just said about using the, you know, market as an indicator for artistic merit, which seems like, you know, expedient from like a legal definition point of view, but really like puts at risk, I think, like, I don't, artistic integrity, I guess, like to speak broadly, because, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've been talking about is how so many of these works, so many of these NFTs are like, right on the line between being financial assets and being actual legitimate in good faith artistic expression like that just happened to inflate in value like wildly and 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 i would argue that the majority of nfts and nft collections that we're seeing like launched over the course of the past year are far more interested in becoming financial assets than in you know probing conceptual <laughs> experiments you know or 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 even like you know pushing aesthetic boundaries or something like that um and then in so geez i don't know how to address this in law but mm -hmm. i do think that there should be a different standard when someone is creating something clearly with the intention of being a financial asset with an image attached in the metadata, which is what a lot of these are, because the market data will read exactly the same as data on good faith artistic expression. And, and I'll say uh, in, uh, in Chris's defense, uh, the Bleistein case, Justice Holmes in 1903, in my view, notoriously decided that the only way to judge the merits of artistic work, at least for purposes of determining if it promoted the progress of science and useful arts, the constitutional phrase, was to look at market valuation. And I think that was a tragic moment in American copyright law that was a Pandora's box of problems. But that's sort of what we're left with is market valuation as the, the measure of seriousness versus non-serious. Yeah, uh, Amy, no. you might disagree, but- No, no, yeah. I, I actually wanted to jump in and, and say, yeah. first of all, that Barton's article on this question is unbelievable and everyone should run out and read it right away on Bleistein and this question. But I, I guess I just wanted to um, say something about a, a, an earlier throwaway comment I made about people and not even wanting to mention people in the same breath as Mitchell. And I think it goes to this question because what we're talking and, and just building on what you said, Mitchell, sort of what we talk about now as NFT artists I think, you know, if I look at the work you're doing and the, the, you know, that you've come, you were coming from the art world and going into NFTs and making art that's really about um, blockchain, almost using it as a medium. And I think, you know, it fits very easily and, and beautifully into the history of art. If we look at someone like Beeple, um, there's nothing about Beeple that the traditional art world would have taken seriously, but there's this financialization of art um, and selling him in the context of the auction house that sort of suddenly made people art in a way that um, really raises a lot of difficult questions back to this general problem that, that we're talking about, about when, when does that special carve out for art really matter and how to determine the difference. And Chris, did you, I did. Yeah, so I got to say, as a, as a someone who's remained a practicing lawyer while being an academic, 
I have to, I have to be pretty pessimistic about judges ability to sort any of this out. I mean, if the market runs some risks, I, I think judges making distinctions about like what's good in FTR and what's not is likely to be pretty much a catastrophe. So, you know, um, pick your poison, I guess, but my, I'm, I'm not a huge market enthusiast in every walk of life, but as a relative matter, I am here. Okay. I, I'm was really interested though, like in this conversation, cause we talked about, you know, calling yourself an artist being like the ultimate get out of jail free to, you know, commit bloody murder, do all sorts of, you know, horrendous vulgar things. Uh, and that's interesting, but like, like now that it's like all of the rules and all the possibilities change whenever calling yourself an artist comes with the ability to create very liquid assets. And, you know, I talked to, I, this is why I love talking to legal scholars about art. People wouldn't believe it, but I actually, I love talking to lawyers about art, you know, because whatever, we're talking about how we regulate human behavior. And I was talking to another legal scholar, uh, Brian L. Fry at the University of Kentucky. Oh, yeah. And he and why you alum? And why you alum? Sorry, to is he? okay. He's that an is alum. Okay. Go violets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I was I was almost an NYU alum. Yeah. And um, but he likes to talk about NFTs as basically the securitization of influence, right? And it is like, and, and that's a pretty good description because there are basically numerous influencers, right? We've seen like the rise of crypto influencers. If you have like 100,000, 200,000 followers on Twitter, basically you can release a collection and that like sort of collection, you can dip count on the fact that those 100,000 followers like will be able to produce some scarcity and some buy pressure on the NFT collection, right? And for all intents and purposes, like the image is is an afterthought, right? But the market data will be there. And it's like, so all of a sudden, if we can attach images to what are essentially pyramid scheme, like securities, like, is that gonna be a crazy get out of jail free card for people who are really good in this attention economy? So I will, finally, I get my chance to quote Georg Zimmel and my favorite line, well, not one of my favorite lines from him, money increasingly becomes nothing but money. And he was just talking about like the history of capitalism and really uh, what he was even in maybe in the early 1900s see, perceiving as like late capitalism was already just money was just dematerializing into nothingness. And one wonders if something similar could be wondered about um, the kinds of conduct that Mitchell's describing uh, right now. But we, we're actually at 1.43. Um, and so we just have a few minutes left for Q&A. And I thought it might be worthwhile then to start shifting over to some of these excellent questions in the chat and also nail down a few things. And I wanted to get this, this is maybe, um, we've already covered this, but I just wanted to cover it again, especially for the law students. Just the very basic question, what is the relation between intellectual property rights and NFTs? And this question I'll hook on to one of the chat questions, which was, does the purchaser of the NFT have the right to profit from the image? Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll offer uh, one answer, which is there is no relation between NFTs and IP. Um, um, so Chris, go ahead. It's more case specific. So yeah. let's start with copyright. Um, so it's entirely possible to make an NFT, to mint an NFT by pointing to an image that's already up on the web publicly available, making a hash of that image, pointing to that URL. Um, that does not involve the exercise of any of the exclusive rights that are given to the copyright owner by the Copyright Act. That's actually a copyright neutral thing. That's like, if you own a book, you can throw it or sleep on it, right? If you, if you have access to an image, you can make an NFT of it. So what, what can actually implicate copyright is if you copy the image to make the NFT. So for example, if you have access to an image in some form and you make a copy of it to post it, right? For example, on a, on a, on a website, and then you use that website image as the image to which you're pointing in the, in the, in the NFT. That involves making reproduction. So, you know, that's a copyright infringement or at least a potential copyright infringement, but without regard to the NFT, the NFT is kind of irrelevant to this. You, you just happen to make the copy in the process of making the NFT. It's not the NFT that makes that copyright infringement. Um, you know, then, then of course there's trademark and, you know, strictly speaking, the NFT doesn't, well, I mean, 
I, I can't think of an example where the NFT includes a trademark, right? Because trademarks are usually either words used on a product or service or, you know, symbols used on a product or service. It's not the NFT. It's, you know, for example, in the Meta Birkins case, it's the title of an artwork that is associated with the NFT. So I really have to, you know, um, we have to observe one thing, which is, you know, what are the rights associated with the image? So that, that really just depends on an agreement with the rights holder. So, you know, Mitchell mentioned earlier, some um, customers, some, some people who buy NFTs are saying, I want the commercial rights to do X or Y with the image. And that, you know, typically not encoded into the NFT, that's, that's typically negotiated, uh, maybe informally, but with respect to, co to copyright, if there's going to be a transfer of copyright ownership in the in the image, even an exclusive license in the image, that's going to have to be done in writing, um, a writing that's not going to be actually encodable in an NFT. So the, the the two enterprises are kind of orbiting one another, but they they rarely intersect, is the way I'd put it. Um, okay, well let's um, now go to more explicitly some of the questions in the chat, and I'm going to sort of group some of them together. And um, I won't read them out in detail. Regrettably, I might be doing injustice to them, but uh, I found really interesting the first question uh, in the chat, uh, how can you turn real world objects into NFT, say a painting on the wall sold at Sotheby's? And I've, I've actually wondered about this quite a lot because there are NFTs that point to material things. How do you enforce that link? And I'll add on to that, sadly, like a a different question, essentially. A uh, different person is asking, is there any way that NFTs could make fungible art media, art media like movies or songs non-fungible? So uh, NFTs attached to real world physical things made of carbon and NFTs for not one image, but let's say a full-blown uh, movie. I think I know the answer to the second question, but uh, what do we say to those queries? I'll start. I mean, you can make an NFT connected to anything. Um, although the typical the typical scenario that we've grown used to is the connection to a digital image. Um, there's no reason you can't point to a real world object, um, a human, <laughs> for that matter, or to moving pictures. But but the key is, and I think just to go back to something that Chris said that's important. Um, I think what's interesting here is you don't there's a lot of discussion about fraud and scams right now with NFTs where somebody other than the, and this is usually considered to be someone other than the rights holder, like to a painting, makes an NFT. Like, let's say I make an NFT of a work of art by a famous artist. Let's, who would I do it of? Um, a famous living artist. Um, let's say I make an NFT of a Rothko painting that I think is still in copyright. Well, if I don't include an image of the Rothko painting in, in you know, offering for sale that NFT, then I have not committed any kind of copyright offense at all. I may be liable for fraud if I market it as a legitimate Rothko NFT, the painting. I've committed fraud in some way and violated who knows what. But if I say this is an Amy Adler um, NFT of a Rothko, I have not committed fraud. I have not committed any kind of copyright infringement. Again, assuming I don't um, don't use an image in connection with it. Um, however, I may have created something that I would assume is really quite worthless because my name <laughs> is now the brand associated with the work, and um, I am not worth anything, sadly, as an artist. Yeah, the um, question oh, with yeah, the yeah, objects is like, how do you point to them, right? That's always that's always the question. And you know, it's funny people ask that question, and then the response is, well, how do you point to something with a certificate of authenticity on paper, right? You just essentially describe the thing, and that points to it. And you know, the NFT can, in a sense, describe the thing too. It could point, for example, to an image of the object that is available online. Um, but you know, again, like people ask these questions about NFTs, and I. I do think it's funny that we never thought like, well, what's the mechanism for a certificate of authenticity on paper to work? And the, the answer is just social convention. That's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, I'll shift over now to another topic that I'll sort of group together some questions which we've mentioned and maybe there's not much more we can say about it, but it's the, the bad reputation of the NFT world for money laundering 
Maybe that's more for crypto, but for money laundering. And here as a non-art world person, I'll say for the art world as well for, for uh, money laundering, but let's just stick to NFTs. And then the idea that these are becoming investment vehicles for quite serious investment vehicles and the possibility that they could be regulated under the Securities Act or something like that, which I realize is outside of the bounds of expertise here. But um, Mitchell is, is the money laundering. I mean, you've been quite open about it today that there's, you know, there's some part of the, cult of the community that is not, I think you use the term in good faith or bad faith or whatever, but is, do you sense that there's going to be regulation coming down the road? Are there fears of Congress getting involved or is for the moment, does it remain pretty much a self-regulated uh, world? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't say self-regulated. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that, yes, I mean, look, regulation is is coming for for crypto assets in one way or another, um, which which I think is a positive thing um, that will, you know, make it safer for more widespread adoption. I can't like I can't really comment on the money laundering capacity in crypto or NFTs because I try to only talk about stuff that I've actually got experience with. Um, but I do know that, um, you know, blockchain comes with like robust tools for tracking transactions. Like that's the, the whole idea is that, you know, it is a permanent, unalterable and completely visible transparent ledger of transactions. And I do know that, um, you know, government officials like have pretty sophisticated tools for tracking that. So hopefully that's um, cutting down on, um, yeah, some like malfeasance in the space or whatever. Yeah, I think the money laundering thing is kind of funny. It's like, you know, money laundering allegations are made against pretty much every new medium of exchange. Um, you know, the funny thing about crypto, though, and in, in terms of, you know, we we're talking about fiat art earlier, and just to revive that term, which I think is a great term. So, you know, Marcel Duchamp takes a urinal and he he basically declares it a work of art. And, you know, that declaration is a turning point in art history. He's making the point that, you know, art is an active authority, art is an active institutional authority, and he's the authority. Um, funny thing is like, you know, not too much later when he's doing that, Adolf Hitler is basically making some points about art and Hitler's points about art is no, art has kind of formal standards, right? Aesthetics is, is a kind of knowable thing. It's not an active authority. So if you think of like how mixed up that is, you know, Duchamp, the kind of leftist anarchist and Hitler not, they're, they're kind of crossing paths there. But, you know, in terms of uh, fiat, so, <clears throat> uh, Art in the metaverse, to me, um, is not fiat art, right? Art in the metaverse, to me, is in a way like an older form. It, it is competing for attention based on kind of one of the oldest things, I think, in markets, which is what the expectation is for, you know, what the price will be of this next week. Um, and that's like the opposite of fiat art. That's like, that's putting your art at the service of, you know, the crowd, um, which always struck me about this market. Um, okay, then we have, we have a hard stop at two. So we can, we just can't go past it, but I, I can't resist asking maybe one more question uh, inspired by a question in the chat. And it's, of course, it's a trademark question. Um, it brings us back to the idea of the flex. And I, I guess I'm just like an old person. Like I've, I've not really, I have no social media presence. I uh, don't exist in anything other than the physical world basically. And so I just don't understand how it, displaying a little NFT rep, represent, my ownership of an NFT could represent a flex to someone. That is to an assertion of hierarchical superiority through pecuniary spending power, or whatever else uh, against someone else. Here's the better version of that question from the chat a little bit more down to earth. Are purely digital goods protected by trademark? If my avatar wants to carry a Birkin bag in the metaverse, can Hermes prevent the sale of digital Birkin bags by third parties? If so, how is the digital good example different than the digital art example? And um, Chris, I don't know if you want to address this or stay away from this. Um, I'll propose a, a little quick point, which is uh, in the case of Rothschild, he, he's not selling 
simple photographs of the Birkin bag. He's telling artistic interpretations, transformations of the Birkin bag. But I think there is an interesting question about actual photorealistic representations of Birkin bags in the, in the metaverse. What do we do with that? So there are actual photorealistic representations of Birkin bags in the meatverse right yeah. now. I mean, there's an okay. Australian artist, I forget her name, who is extraordinarily talented illustrator who drew a Birkin bag. Um, so that, that's that's happening now. And you know, I think the the way we think about that is like Campbell's soup cans, you know, uh, painting a Birkin bag, this is artistic expression, and we balance trademark rights with artistic expression. You know, and I think behind all this is the notion, well, okay, so Hermes has a market in Birkin bags. And, you know, if they want to have a market in virtual Birkin bags, they can have a market in virtual Birkin bags. They, they may just not be able to limit people's artistic use of the Birkin bag. Um, that's, that's a, you know, a small chunk out of what might otherwise be a very large market. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the, to make sure that we close up before two, uh, it might be worthwhile to leave it there um, and um, thank Mitchell uh, so much. I realize you're traveling currently and it's so kind of you to take the time to join us in this uh, discussion. And then also uh, Chris and Amy, of course, thank you uh, for your continuing work on this stuff and also for your participation today. I apologize to the uh, questions submitted in chat, which we've all had the nice chance to read. Some of them are quite detailed and, and sophisticated uh, that we haven't addressed openly, uh, but they have definitely been uh, registered uh, here. And so I think we'll conclude it there. Thank you all for attending and for such a great turnout for this uh, event and um, uh, good afternoon to all of you. So long. Thanks, Barton. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. It was, a, it was a real pleasure. <laughs>